All right, everyone. Welcome to Origin and Causes seminar titled Under the Weather, Getting to the Root Cause of Wind and Snow Damage Claims. My name is George Castandi, and I'll be your moderator today. First off, I just uh, hope that you and your families are in good health and in safety. I'm glad you guys have all made it out. Thank you for joining us. We've had an awesome uh, turnout uh, for and signups, and uh, a lot of folks have tuned in. So thank you so much, all from all the way you know coast to coast in Canada. And we've got several folks joining us from the states. So thank you to all for joining us. Just wanted to go through a couple of quick points first before we get into things. Uh, we'll be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions via the text box under the webinar, the, the, the webinar panel there. We promise to get to as many questions as possible. If we don't get to your question that you've submitted, submitted during the hour, uh, we promise to follow up with you after the webinar and answer your questions. So please, uh, even if you see us running out of time, submit questions and we make sure, we'll make sure to get back to you about it. All questions will be answered anonymously. Unless you want a shout out, just state your name and your company name and, uh, and then your question and comment and, and we'll give you that shout out. Um, just a heads up as a disclaimer, all information discussed in this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. Um, uh, you know, when in doubt, you should give us a shout, give us a call just to have a, a, a discussion uh, relating to the specific thing, the specific claim or file that you're handling at that time. And we will guide you through those, uh, you know, through the technical uh, nuances or any questions that you may have. Those types of discussions are entirely free. Our clients are calling us every day um, asking us for you know, asking us specific questions that they should be asking or or guidance. Um, we don't open files for that. It's just quick, casual discussions. So please, please give us a shout anytime. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our webinar, LinkedIn, YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass this on to your colleagues um, in future meetings. We'll be sending each of you a completion certificate in a follow-up email. Uh, this webinar has been uh, accredited in Manitoba and British Columbia. Um, other provinces that uh, heavily rely on accreditation, such as Alberta and Saskatchewan, we will submit uh, for accreditation in, in the coming week or so. So they're not accredited at this time. There's no guarantees that we can get accreditation uh, in those provinces, but we'll give it a shot. And if we do, we'll send you guys all a quick email advising you of the course numbers. At the end of the webinar, when you close the GoToWebinar window, the program's gonna prompt you to answer a few quick questions about the webinar. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback, ranking the speakers and the content. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please email us at webinar at origin dash and-cause.com. So let's jump into it. I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Nabi Gadarzi, who is uh, based in Ottawa, Ontario. He's a professional engineer in Alberta, uh, licensed in Alberta, Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. His specialties include civil and structural engineering, earthquake engineering, he investigates damaged or under-designed structures, assisting with the review and the design of retrofitting schemes. And he conducts structural investigations on industrial, commercial, and residential buildings. We also have Darren Keel joining us today, uh, based out of our Ottawa office. Uh, his specialties uh, are remote pilot piloted aerial systems, uh, drone operation. Uh, he does pre-loss and post-loss site inspections, uh, field investigations, and aerial scene mapping. He's responsible for the drone, drone operations and training of community safety partners, including the Canadian Emergency Responders Robotics Association, and he also is uh, authorized flight reviewer for Transport Canada. 
In addition to his drone operation uh, experience, he also was a level three traffic collision investigator and a level four collision reconstructionist with over 30 years of policing experience. Uh, with that being said, I'll pass on the mic uh, to Nabi. Thank you, George, for the introduction. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us in this webinar. So in this webinar, I'm going through uh, multiple examples of the files that we dealt with in the past. And through these examples, I uh, give, the, give you the causes of potential causes of damage after wind and or snow. I begin this webinar by mentioning the importance of forensic structural investigation. And I mention how it is important for to determine the insurance coverage. And not only that, but also for the safety of the occupants and also to determine the required structural repairs. And as for the cause of damage, a lot of times we get the files uh, or claims that are initially coming in as snow damage or wind damage, but we get in and we investigate and we find out that commonly they're not the true cause of damage. There are some other underlying deficiencies, uh, some pre-existing pre conditions. So these include pre-existing construction deficiencies or unintended load path, non-engineered alterations or long-term deterioration. And uh, sometimes it might be the case that the snow or wind loading was extremely above the design code. Now, as we go through these examples, I talk about some of the principles of structural design and how we use safety factors to design buildings. And at the end, we have a mock inspection of a house using drones. So I want to start with uh, this question that why is forensic structural investigation needed? And I'm asking this because the cause of loss seems obvious in most cases. For example, this file we got as a snow damage and you see that dimple in the roof, we call it deflection and it was after heavy, um, heavy snow load in a very uh, bad winter. And the other file came in uh, again as a crack in the ceiling after the winter, so presumably because of the snow. And the other file was came in as a wind damage. So this building was only four years old and it got damaged under wind in a windstorm. This file came in as a damage after Hurricane Dorian. So as you see, that this, some would assume that it's very obvious. It's because of the, the hurricane, because of the snow, because of the wind. So in most cases, the cause of loss seems obvious. It's just that it seems obvious, but it's not really what it seems. And we want to get into that. Um, through the following examples. So the structural forensic structural investigation is needed to determine the insurance coverage, determine the required repair, and to address the safety concerns of the structure. Now I have to mention that especially two and three are very important from a structural standpoint, and it's because even if the damage is covered regardless, we need to know why it got damaged. Is it because of a very heavy snow exceeding the design code? Or is it because of some deficiency in the structure? Because if it's a deficiency in the structure, we need to address that deficiency. We need to do more repair work. The other thing is, uh, for the safety concern of the structure, when you see a crack or a deflection in a house, that's a initial sign or symptom of an underlying deficiency. 
uh, and for that you need uh, a structural engineer to investigate if there's anything wrong. So I'm going through uh, some examples here. Example one is uh, about construction deficiency. Uh, you've seen this photo before. So this is the dimple in the roof. Uh, it, it was it happened after the snow season, and we got in to see why it happened and propose some repairs. Before I get deeply into the files and examples, I want to give you some background of structure of the roof. So we have the ceiling joist. And above the ceiling joist, we have the rafters. And you have the ridge board. And you have the cutter tie. And these are the columns. So you have under the snow load, uh, you have the gravity load of the snow. So it's coming down and it goes through the rafter. So in the rafter, you have compression. And also at the peak here, you also have compression against the ridge board. Um, so these rafters need to be aligned. So here you have compression. Now at this point, when the compression comes down, you have you get tension in the ceiling joist. And that's just because of the inclination of this compression force that gives you the tension in the ceiling joist. And then uh, the vertical component of this compression goes to the column. So this is how it should be. So the rafters should be continuous. It should be one full length solid piece of wood. It cannot be multiple pieces of wood connected to each other. And if they are like that, they should be properly designed. But usually they don't need to be multiple pieces. They're just one full length piece. The color tie here is to resist the tension under wind load, where we have the suction. So under wind load, you get suction on the, on the roof. So if you don't have the color tie, the rafters, uh, tend to open up. Of course, they're connected at the ridge board, but those connections are not enough. So we have the cutter tie here to keep the rafters together. Uh, and of course, uh, here uh, in the cutter tie, you get the tension. So this is a, a image of a properly constructed roof. You see the rafter, the ridge board, and you see the cutter tie. Now let's get back to the example we had. So it was a dimple or deflection in the roof. We got into the attic. We saw the rafters. So this rafter is continuous. It's just one full length solid piece. You have the cutter tie, which is good. But every other rafter, it was discontinuous. So it was two pieces coming together and connected to each other. And when you when you connect two pieces to each other, you need to add uh, two pieces on the side of the rafter and uh, connect it to the uh, rafter pieces. These side pieces are called splices. So they overlap the rafters. And so these side pieces are uh, splices. They are okay if they are designed properly, but in this case, they're not even designed properly. And there's no need to splice rafters. There are, you can use full length lumbers. And in this particular example, the rafters uh, were even undersized. This is another uh, roof. So this was an old roof. And the owners added an extension to the house. So they added uh, rafters uh, and they added the ridge board. Now, just here you can see that the rafters are not uh, aligned with each other. So if you remember, I said there are compression forces in the rafters and there are compression forces against the ridge board. So that compression force against this ridge board should be transferred to the other rafter, but the rafters are not aligned. 
So that goes th through the ridge board. And if the ridge board is not designed properly for that compression force, which are usually not, uh, that is a problem. Again, uh, showing the rafters being not aligned. And also here you can see even the rafters on one side of the ridge board are not continuous because you can see the old rafters and they put a plate here and they added these new rafters and this rafter here is not aligned with the old rafter. To make matters worse, uh, they put a beam here, which is fine, but this pan of this beam exceeds the acceptable length of the, uh, of the beam. So another cause of, another common cause of damage after a snow event is unintended load path. So again, this file came in as a snow damage and it was after it was during the snow the owners heard an explosive sound and they came uh, to the dining room and they saw this crack in the paint and it started from here the corner of the wall and it extended all the way across and above the dining room so we got into the attic to see what was the cause of the damage. So this is the view of the attic. So everything looks fine at first sight. You can see rafters, cutter, cutter ties, which is fine. These members here are temporary construction struts. They're not intended and designed to carry any load. So they're just put in place during construction so they uh, set up the ridge board and they uh, put up the rafters and that's it technically after the construction these need to be repaired these need to be removed and here is why if you remember i said you have the roof you have the gravity loads and you have the compression in the rafters and then compression in the columns and also tension in the seating joists. What happens is that, so again, so this is over the dining room. So again, this whole system is a complete uh, load carrying mechanism. So the load comes through the rafters to the columns. So it is stable. It's a full, it's a full load path, a complete load path. Now, you put these uh, struts to set up during the construction to set up the ridge board and the rafters, which is fine. But after the construction, if you don't remove this, now the snow load is transferred to the strut. So instead of half of the snow load, instead of going through the rafter, it's now going to, through the strut and then from the strut to the seating joist. And then from the seating joist, it goes through shear to the columns. So this seating joist is not designed uh, to carry that load, the load of the temporary strut. So when that happens, you have that unintended sustained load over the seating joist. And over time, uh, you have fatigue in the member. Fatigue means deformation under a sustained load over a long time. So you have uh, you have deformation under the under the load, and that deformation translates into the cracking. And this is another example, uh, which is. Uh, related to non-engineered alterations where the owners uh, make some additions uh, to presumably make things better. Uh, so they have the right intention, but uh, it is not really engineered that way. So here the file came in as a snow, uh, snow damage. Uh, the owners noticed the cracks uh, after the snow. And so we got in, uh, we got into the 
seen. We talked to the owners and we figured that years ago they uh, put up new rafters uh, to, to increase the slope of the roof. So the old roof of the house was actually truss. So the trusses, they were very low slope and they were sitting on, on a beam. So in the middle, this is a beam. This beam on one end is sitting on a wall and it's going across the, the living room and it's going to, uh, at the other end, it's sitting on the other exterior wall. So this is the old truss. And the owner added the rafters to increase the slope of the roof to decrease the snow load. So right idea. But the problem is, if you remember, under gravity loads, uh, we have the snow coming down, you have the rafters, and then here you have the tension. So this tension uh, is going through the ceiling joist. So the ceiling joist needs to be continuous. But here we don't have the continuity of the ceiling joist. So there's a gap here. So this is the beam. This was the old beam. And this is the truss. And there was nothing underneath because it was not designed to be in tension. Uh, but they added the rafters. So they changed the load path of the building. So they changed the intended load path of the building. Uh, and they didn't notice this discontinuity here. And when you have that discontinuity, the tension force goes through the drywall and that cracks. This is the view of the attic just above the old roof. So the old roof is here, uh, which is which are the trusses. And this is the uh, these are the added rafters. So everything looks fine. So they did a perfect job of putting new sound roof, but they didn't really look at the entire load path because the entire system should work together. You cannot just uh, add something. Uh, when you add, when you make an addition to a building, you need to look at the whole, the entire load distribution system of the building. Now let's look at the structural design um, of buildings uh, for snow and wind. So the snow and wind loads are prescribed in building codes. We have National Building Code of Canada in 2015, uh, which is the latest uh, code. And the provincial codes are, for every province we have provincial code, Ontario building codes, uh, Alberta build, building codes. So the national building codes um, are adopted and modified in each province and territory. And the, and the snow and wind loads are prescribed in these codes. And then in general, in design of buildings, we have safety factors that are, again, prescribed in the codes. Now, let's begin with designing a simple structure. Uh, let's say we want to design a chair um, for just for people. So the average weight of a person, let's say, is 200 pounds. So if I design this chair for a 200 pound person, um, if the person is 200 pounds, the chair will be fine. But if the person is heavier than 200 pounds, the chair will fall. So the and I said the average weight is 200 pounds. And by, and by definition, average means 50% of people will be heavier than 200 pounds and 50% will be uh, uh, lighter than 200 pounds. So if I design that chair for 200 pounds, it will collapse 50% uh, of the times. And you don't wanna sit on a chair that has 50% chance of failure. So what I do uh, to design this chair, I say, okay, average is 200 pounds, um, but the weight of the people are from, I don't know, like 150 pounds to 300 pounds. So I'm gonna design for 300 pounds, that's safer. Uh, and then on top of that, 
I say, okay, I'm not going to design exactly the chair for a 300 pound person. I'm going to design it for higher than that, like let's say 400 or 450 pounds. So this is, so I designed the chair for 450 pounds and a heavy person, let's say is 300 pounds. So it, it is safe. So this is called safety in structure. At the same time, I should say that um, the heaviest person in the world, I Googled it, uh, he was 1,400 pounds. I'm not going to design the chair for a 1,400 pound person because that would be very heavy. And there's only one person with that weight. So if I design every chair for 1,400 pounds, that would be very uneconomical. So here are three, uh, three main concepts. We use the um, high loads um, for to design buildings um, and not necessarily the average loads. The second principle is that we increase the, uh, the load by percentage to make our design safe, and that's called safety factor. The third principle is that we are not designing structures for outlying events or outliers. Um, so now we see how it uh, works in structures. So these are the load combinations for, uh, for structures. These are just a couple of them. We have multiple load combinations. So we combine or we add loads together when we design structures. So this is dead load or self weight of the structure. And this is snow load. So you see that we are increasing the snow load by 50%. And this snow load is not the average snow load. This snow load is the maximum snow load in 50 years. So here you see how we are designing for higher loads to, uh, to keep the design safe. So these are the design values for uh, prescribed in NBC 2015, this is, this is National Building Code of Canada, uh, versus actual values in 2019 and 2020. So let's say, for example, in Sudbury, the design value, the height of the snow, the ground snow was 70, is 71 centimeters. The actual snow load in 2019 was 102 centimeters. And if you remember, we designed the roof for 50% higher than this load. So this gives us 106 centimeters of snow. So if I get a file, let's say that the roof collapsed under this 102 centimeters of snow, uh, uh, I know r right off the bat that it's not because of this note. There should be something, uh, some pre-existing conditions, some deficiencies. The same for wind speed. So these wind speeds are based on maximum speed of uh, wind in uh, 50 years. And you can see like for Ottawa, for example, 91 kilometer per hour. Uh, the actual in 2019 was 89. So if a roof was blown off um, under the wind, it's not really because of the wind, it's because it was not properly designed, constructed, or maintained. In St. John's, however, uh, the, the prescribed snow load was 83 uh, centimeters and the snow load in 2020 in the snowstorm, it was 125. It's pushing the limit. It's above that 150% of this design value. So if some roof collapsed in this uh, uh, snow, it might be because of the extreme snow load that you had back then. So I'm giving you some more examples of non-engineered alterations. So this is a barn and so this was the original wall. These openings were not existing in the original building. So the owner removed the studs and opened these openings uh, for their use. And after some snow load, uh, it collapsed and the file came in as a uh, snow load damage. 
So this is the image uh, from inside the barn. So these are the trusses. You see at the trusses are sitting at uh, over the beam and the beam, under the beam, at the location of every truss, there is a stud. So the truss comes in here, it's sitting on a support and on, uh, under any under any truss, there is this stud. Now, when you remove the stud, the truss is come and sitting only on the beam. And this beam is not designed to uh, carry the load of the truss. So it will break eventually. And that's what happened here. Uh, so these are the studs, the beams, and they removed the studs. And after some snowstorm, it just collapsed. Here's another example. This is an example of long-term deterioration. Uh, so this is the a barn. You can see the roof collapsed and this part of the roof is sliding off. So we used drone because we wanted to see the failure pattern and also to see the, uh, the failure mechanism inside the barn under the roof uh, and it was unsafe for me to get in and by looking at the uh, roof uh, failure pattern we can see what uh, or where the damage was initiated and um, we can determine the cause of the damage for this particular barn the cause of the damage was uh, the uh, long-term deterioration of the wood and the connections. This this was a 100 year old barn. Um, so you can see the connections here, the nail uh, were withdrawn here, all the black stains here are signs of moisture damage. You can see the moisture damage, splitting of the wood here. This is another barn. The question here was, if it was damaged because of the wind or snow. So we used the drone and uh, we got um, overall shots of the roof to see how it got damaged and uh, to see the details of damage uh, at the high elevations top on the roof. It was you know, inaccessible for me to uh, uh, to inspect these connections and these failed connections. Uh, we, so this is um, me and our drone specialist um, that we were inspecting this remotely. So you can see here, you can see that the concentrated damage zone is on the southeast corner of the roof and, and the wind direction was towards southeast and it was a, uh, snowstorm. So in this particular file, the snow was accumulated here and it uh, caused the roof to collapse. Um, again, this was a hundred year old uh, barn and it was uh, and it was not properly designed because at that time the the code was not uh, was not enforced. So, so as a summary, when the files come in as a snow or wind damage, they could be, uh, it, it is possible that it's because of extreme snow or wind load exceeding the code design values. But com most commonly it's because of some pre-existing design or construction deficiencies and or non-engineered non -engineered alterations, unintended load paths or long-term deterioration. Now, um, we need forensic structural engineering uh, to investigate all these cases. Uh, first of all, to determine the root cause of damage, but also to, to determine the structural repair and also to prevent major failure in future. And as I said earlier, the signs of the initial signs of damage are deflections, cracks, and we need to get in to inspect 
if this structure is, is sound and if they are not sound we need to do repairs just for the safety of the occupants and to prevent major failure in future also to repair the structural members we need to know what is the exact cause of the damage is it snow is it a very extremely high snow if it is then we just replace the damaged member but if it's not then we have to address the main cause of the damage now with that uh, we get to the exciting part of the webinar uh, we as i said we use drone to to inspect the spaces that are not easy to access and are unsafe or at high elevations and our drone specialist darren keel uh, helps us uh, he flies the drone and we do our inspections and the drone videos and photos give us invaluable information that helps us in our investigation and assessment of the structure so let's see uh, let's see what uh, Darren is going to show us today hey Darren how are you doing good nap So here so, we're flying at, yep, we're flying at a residence in Kingston and doing a um, simulated inspection with the drone flight systems. Yeah, so nice, it's nice weather. So as you can see, you can you can see the entire roof here. And uh, and if it was a damaged roof, like the barns that we had before, you could see the damaged details. And uh, to determine the mechanism of the damage. So Darren, what drone are you using here? Uh, this drone is a French built Paradinafi work drone. Um, it's an excellent small system for getting in really close. Uh, the gimbal enables me to be able to pitch the gimbal or the camera straight down and straight up as well as uh, zoom in. So I'm actually zooming in on the structure here without flying closer. Yeah can see you can see the shingles here you can see the so if it was damaged you can you could see all the details and even for industrial buildings it's very helpful because you can see the damaged parts at high elevations which saves a lot of uh, time effort um, and all this inspection like takes like maybe 30 minutes and you, it gives you invaluable information for for assessment. So just descending down to uh, below the eaves trough uh, to inspect an actual um, area where some raccoons try to get into uh, the attic of this structure. So uh, I'm able to maneuver the drone in uh, quite close to the structure and then um, zoom in. So it's an integration between structural analysis uh, engineer and uh, me, the operator, to be able to uh, integrate or interact and uh, and discuss what's needed for the video or the inspection. This the camera's pitched 90 degrees straight down, flying over the roof line, probably about two feet off the uh, off the, the shingles. And again, following the direction of the engineer as to what's required for the inspection. So we're continuing aft, and this was an eaves trough inspection along the uh, the lower uh, roof line. And might note that um, Navi, this is the bomb shot. I'm going to climb up, and it gives you a very good overall view of the uh, targeted structure. And a bomb shot is looking straight down at the location. And it's very important. The bomb shots give us the mechanism of the failure, the pattern of the failure, and from there we can determine where the damage was initiated. This very valuable information. Yeah, this is a, a great way of uh, pitching that camera, like I said, straight down, looking directly down at the target, and I can come from 400 feet right down to one foot above the, the target. Um, this was an entering into a three-season room, and we're going to demonstrate how, with the camera, we can look straight up at the roof line and um, zooming in. So this is not moving the drone. This is actually just zooming in on an area that the engineer required and zooming back out. Yeah. So, and if it was a damaged roof and it was unsafe for me to get in, 
drone, you can see that it's very, uh, can safely and quickly get inside, get the videos and photos for us to complete our assessment. This is the pitching the camera straight up. So it's uh, the only drone that, that does that. And again, we're able to inspect the, the trusses directly above us. Um, we're just switching drones here. And um, this is the small uh, DJI Mavic Mini. And we're gonna do a, a, a demonstration on a, a very tight crawl space area uh, below a deck to do an inspection. Um, we put pro what, things called propeller guards on it. So if we do in fact bump, any part of the structure, I'm able to recover the drone and, and not crash it. You can, see, you can see how stable it is um, under the deck. So we yes, use this, this. So we use this uh, drone like for inspecting crawl spaces, attics, even like flooded basements. I found it it's extremely stable and uh, I'm able to take the direction from the engineer as to what he needs to to do his inspection even in the close close tight spaces. So Darren is there any danger of the props getting hit to the members or? Um, I have a, a cage around the drone so 95 percent of the time you're good however if something dangled into the prop you could uh, you could um, we call it crash or land the drone, but uh, mostly you can bump right into the structure and uh, and the drone will still fly. Um, it's more if something was hanging and got caught into it, but um, it's perils of the job. But we're we're, we're getting pretty good at, um, at at these tight space flying. Yeah. yeah. And if for any reason we are not uh, at scene at the same time, we just uh, Darren will fly the drone and uh, I'll just do inspection remotely. Right, and we're also able to uh, um, include the client in on that inspection as well. So yeah. um, it can, can be a, call. a conference call via drone, yeah. And then if there's something we're missing or something more that's needed, um, you'll see below there's a, we'll illuminate a structure if it's uh, very, very uh, dark, but uh, they operate decently in uh, low light. Um, so we just position uh, uh, mobile lights around to eliminate what we need to see. So Darren, how long can you fly the drone? Right, uh, these systems operate 25 to 30 minutes uh, per battery. And um, I always come with ample batteries for the for the entire flight. So um, they have a very good flight time. So. This is a, a structure entering in, simulating that, um, again, a high area that we can't uh, get to or inaccessible. So I'm able to uh, very slowly, now a lot of these maneuvers, you're not really flying around very fast. You're just position, <laughs> positioning the drone where it's required to get a better vantage point for the uh, damage of the structure. So in this case, I'm uh, gonna hover it up almost to the very uh, peak of the roof and inspect uh, the horizontal trusses. trusses. Yeah. You can see all the details here. So this is the structure with the exposed uh, members, like the raptors ridge board you can see the details connections number of nails and so these are very important information for our assessment and i'll mention it appears that the video is uh, um kind of jagged but it's not it's just the the lag here in the um in the webinar but the uh the video is extremely fluid and um it oh, doesn't, yes. it's not it's not jittery like this uh when it's recorded yeah yeah for sure Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Darren. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. And have a good day, everybody. We really appreciate you all being here. Yeah, that was awesome. Okay, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us in this webinar. So, George, now I'm going to pass the mic to you. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, that was a cool simulation. Um, so, this will uh, bring us to the Q&A portion of the webinar um, we have a few qu questions that have been submitted so far um, so i will get right into it give me a quick second here sorry just uh, flipping my screen here so uh, let's go to the first submitted question what does the word deflection mean in the snowstorm slide? So, so Navi, so, do you mind answering that? So, so that 
dip or sagging of the roof that you saw um, in this slide, that's called deflection. So it's so when you look at it, it's like sagging down a bit, uh, and it's very noticeable. That's called deflection. Okay, great. Next question. In general, is there a specific part of a roof that fails uh, under snow load, i.e. at the ridge? Well, mostly, well, it depends on the roof structure, how, I mean, what deficiencies are there. Mostly what I've seen is the rafters that are problematic. They're not properly designed, they're undersized, or they're spliced, or they're not continuous, they're not one solid piece, and they're not aligned at the ridge, or, yeah. Okay, very cool. Next question, what is wood truss uplift, and is this common? It, it, can, it can happen. So wood trust uplift is happens because of the um, moisture effect of the moisture effect, moisture and thermal effect on trusses. So that's the differential movement of the uh, bottom cord of the truss versus uh, the upper portion of the truss. And when that happens, uh, the truss moves a bit up and you will see cracking at the, usually at the wall connections. So is it common? It's not as common. Uh, uh, yeah, it depends. Like I haven't seen it commonly, so. Okay, but you do see it take place, just not you yeah, know, every yeah. other file or something. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next most question. Commonly, the most common is just uh, the damages under uh, under snow because of the, the deficiencies being undersized, being discontinuous, like multiple pieces just connected together without being engineered. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question: Can you fly inside a building if it is unsafe to enter a building? Absolutely. That's exactly what we are doing and what so we have done in the in the barn in one of the barns that I showed you uh, it was unsafe um, to fly inside because the roof was partly collapsed so we flew the drone inside to see what is damaged uh, what are the member sizes what are the connections um, yeah so that okay. that's exactly the per that's exactly one of the um, main purposes of using drone. Okay. Next question: Can you provide detailed measurements of a roof from a drone inspection? You I can, can. I can answer. I can address yeah. that, Navi. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can. So um, we'll employ a program called Drone Deploy. So I will actually fly the drone in what's called an auto grid. Um, so I'll grid the the structure, and um, I can measure it right from the um, from the uh, post processing uh, with the measuring tool, and or we can also send off the information and have a roof report conducted for the location. It'll give uh, pitch. It'll give um, exacting measurements. Yes. So the answer is yes. Great. Thank right. you. Next question. Can Darren give us some tips on flying uh, flying scenes, particularly fire scenes, how to cover the area and what patterns to fly, et cetera? Absolutely. Um, yeah, you don't want to just kind of fly around the scene. You want to actually come in with a plan to start with. Um, it all starts with um, the, the operator linking with the investigator to see what data is actually needed exactly what's needed so you can tailor the flight based on that so primarily i'll i'll meet with the um with the adjuster and and or the the, the client as to what's what's required or the engineer who's uh, who's brought me in and uh, ask what they what, what exactly they need and then uh, generally i'll do a, an orbit flight fly a circular pattern around the structure 
Um, I'll go from a higher altitude to a lower altitude, and then you hone in on um, each side and do it systematically. If you start on the north wall, and and I I always emphasize do it the same way every time so you don't miss something. So if you go from north counterclockwise, um, try to get in the habit of that. Um, you can't take too many photos and you can't take too much video. You can always just discard what you don't need. So take more than less, and um, and then ultimately I think it's a synchronicity between who who's hired you or who's asked you to come and collect the data and um, how you're going to customize that flight. Great, thank you. Next question. Does the difference in the type of snow make a difference? Some snowfalls are wet and heavy while others are dry and fluffy, yet both can measure the same, yet both can measure the same amount. So, you know, in centimeters, it, it both can be measured at the same, like they could both be 10 centimeters of fallen snow, but one is a heavy type of snow and another one is a, is a light, fluffy snow. Can you comment on that, uh, Nabi, please? So, the, yeah, so the type of the snow changes the density of the snow. So the depth of the ground snow load that I reported uh, in this uh, webinar are based on 3.5 kilonewton per cubic meter. That's the average uh, density of the snow. Uh, but for sure, like heavier snow uh, uh, exert a heavier load, like it can go up to like five kilonewton per cubic meter. And fluffy snow is like very light. So certainly it can change the load on the roof. The values that we get from the code is actually in kilonewton per, it is in kPa, uh, kilonewton per uh, square meter. Uh, but I converted that uh, to depth of brown snow uh, just for the purpose of this presentation. But we actually get the value of the load and we use that value. And if for some regions it's a heavy snow, if it's a wet snow, we certainly take that into consideration. Fantastic. So I should add that the, the values that we get from the uh, weather stations, those are depth of the snow. Then to accur accurately determine what the weight of the snow is, we then change that depth of the snow uh, using the proper density of the snow to get the load of the snow and then use the load of the snow and compare it to the snow load prescribed in the design code. Awesome. Thank you, Nabi. Next question. If the roof was, a ste was steel and had snow blockers on it, there is no heating in the structure and snow builds up. Would it not be the responsibility of the owner to remove the build of buildup of snow? Otherwise, the buildup and the weight could cause pressure and cause the structure to collapse. Well, I think that that's probably a, a legal question um, pertaining to the responsibilities of homeowners. Um, Nabi, I guess, like from a structural engineering standpoint, you would be able to verify so, go ahead so we need to see um like who put the snow blockers there and if it was by design and if it was by design then the designer had to consider it in his design but if he, if something were just added after the fact then it was not by design so um but certainly, like, uh, if the snow blockers were meant to be there, it had to be designed for that. So any condition that affects the snow buildup on the roof uh, should be uh, considered. In one of the examples, I uh, mentioned that the roof, the snow accumulated at the southeast of the roof because we had a higher building at the southeast corner. So in the code, uh, by code, we had to um, consider that snow accumulation at that corner. So 
every every parapet, so every every obstruction that blocks the snow from sliding off the snow or uh, or cause the snow to accumulate, it is it has to be considered in the design. If it's not, it's a design deficiency. Okay. If it's if it's added after the fact, then it's something. Uh, some deficiency that was added after the design of this structure. Great. Okay, there's a bunch more questions, so let's try to burn through as many as we can. Um, I've been told that the deflection is not defined as damage. If there is no actual broken members, how do you respond to that? So deflections are, well, we have the amount of deflection. Uh, that is important for us. So, like for example, for roof structures, uh, one so the amount of deflection uh, divided by the length of the uh, span should be one over one hundred eighty. If it's more than that, then it's not acceptable. So, when we see the deflection, we need to see first of all how much deflection are we talking about. And if it's more than that, it's a sign of failure or a sign of upcoming failure. So these are this is one of the initial signs of uh, some deficiency. So if you can if you see if you see a noticeable deflection, it's an initial sign of uh, deficiency, and you have to address that. It's not per se a failure, and uh, and if it was a if it was a failure, like if the uh, roof actually fails, it can cause uh, casualty, like injury. So we don't want that. So, the, so that that is true. Deflection per se is not a sign of failure, but excessive deflection is a sign of underlying deficiency, and it has to be uh, addressed uh, immediately to see if it's uh, yeah to see if it needs to be repaired or not. Okay. Has climate change put greater strain on structures, for example, greater snow loads? Well, absolutely. So in recent years, we've seen um, higher wind loads, higher snow loads uh, in some areas, and uh, it certainly uh, changes the loads, uh, the design loads. And by the way, those design loads in the code are updated uh, uh, every every once in a while based on the current data. So, uh, to the future codes, if we get more snow and or more wind or more hurricanes, the future codes will consider that in the in the updated values. Okay. Next question: How does it work with homeowners' permission? At what point do we need it? I, I think that pertains to uh, drone usage. Sorry, say that again, George. So, like, do you at what point do you need a homeowner's permission to use a drone? Um, yes, we need we need the permission uh, to enter onto the property um, now. So that's, by virtue. Usually, that's typically obtained by the adjuster on the onset of a claim. You guys get all of your clearances, um, you know, your Pepita signed and all of that stuff. And that gives us uh, the clearance because that within within your um, forms, it simply says that, you know, you have a right to investigate and um, and we are part of that investigation. That, that's correct. And um, we're fully liable um, to. Uh, with the, with the systems we fly, so we're we're fully insured for liability. Should we crash the drone and cause further damage or injury to somebody at the location, um, we're not permitted to fly over people. So we conduct a security, our site evaluation for safety and make sure that nobody uh, who's not involved in the operation is below the the system when we're flying. And then if we're in controlled airspace, um, I make the proper applications to Nav Canada for uh, flight authorization in that location. Uh, as well so that's uh, I, I look after all that okay um one last question can a drone get close enough to see hail damage oh absolutely yeah um i literally can fly this the system um 
to touch the roof actually with uh, with the guards on it. Um, but with a small system, if we have to come in really close, um, then yeah, we actually have zoom on it, and I can zoom in on the on the hail damage. So not a problem at all. I can fly within inches of a roof line. Fantastic. We've got several other questions, but we have run out of time. We'll make sure that we do answer those questions. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was a, a fun hour. Uh, please, uh, if you do, if you have a minute, just please answer all the questions that we've uh, requested in that questionnaire. And if you have any other questions, you could send an email to webinar at origin-and-cause.com. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day.